Welcome back to the Autoblog Podcast. I'm Greg Migliori. We have a great show for you this week. We're going to talk about a whole host of different kind of random things. Uh, we have some new rules uh, involving the IIHS. What's a top pick? What isn't? We're going to talk about the, I'm not sure if I'm saying this right, the frat zonic exhaust sound in the Dodge electric muscle cars. We've got potentially heated interior panels for electric cars, according to Ford. And the Pin Pininfarina Batista is perhaps the fastest car, at least according to the latest figures uh, out of their testing. Updates on the Kia EV6, a long-termer, and the Super 73 S2 e-bike. We will spend your money, sort of. We have a good mailbag question. With that, I'll bring in Senior Editor for All Things Consumer, Jeremy Korznewski. How's it going, man? You know, you, people might notice that my voice is a little bit uh, uh, deeper and more nasally than normal. I, I literally left my house one day all of last week, and that one day I managed to catch COVID. Uh, so pretty much recovered at this point. So feeling feeling okay, but you can still hear it in my voice a little bit. So uh, please um, excuse me for that. Um, but uh, doing pretty good. We were just talking earlier today. We often mention the weather at the outset of these shows. Now, Greg lives in the Detroit area. I live in, in Columbus, Ohio area. Uh, it's like a three hour drive away. It's icy and snowy and in the 30s where Greg's at. And it's nearly 70 degrees and sunny here in Columbus. That is an encapsulation of weather in the Midwest for you. It's weird. The like the front lines must be kind of cutting through somewhere around like Toledo or something. Must be, yeah. Because normally we don't. It's not like you're in some tropical paradise three hours south. You know, it's it's a pretty it's a pretty big difference. But hey, yeah, we're back into the 30s tomorrow, so I'm I'm only going to be able to enjoy it for one day before it gets back to uh, winter. Usually we get one day like that, one or two in February at the end of the year, but I don't think we're going to get one this year. We're starting to run out of February. Well, I mean, the weather gods are not smiling on Detroit this year, I guess. Clearly not. Clearly not. Um, yeah. No, other than that, I'm just getting ready for the, the drop of Drive to Survive on Netflix. That is, looks like it's coming tomorrow. You don't normally see like Friday drops on Netflix, I guess, but um, that's when episode one airs. So I'm, I'm excited. I, um, you know, it, it, it's sort of like an annual tradition at this point, you know, that drops, you can kind of recap last year, get in the mood for the new F1 season. Then the first race is March 5th. I didn't I realize know, it was that soon. There's the F1 season is a lot longer than you think it is. It is. It's um, really long. Yeah. There's like a break in the middle that you, you know, it's a couple of weeks where there's no racing. Um, but like it just, you know, it's, it's this glow, it's turned into a global phenomenon. Like, they, you know, they they keep adding races here in the states, and there's so much travel time. Like, it's just, it's like a, it's a big thing. And 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 the season, like here in the U.S., we're used to like sporting seasons that go like half a year. F1 is not like that. They uh, they 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 race a lot. One of the things I actually like about that though is like during the final season or final race of the year, you could kind of look ahead and you're like, oh yeah, no, the next one is like two and a half, three months away. So it's kind of nice. You don't have that whole like gap at the end of maybe baseball season when you're like, oh, wow, it's late October, early November. And then there's no baseball until basically April. So it's, um, right. you know, you don't have as much FOMO, if you will. But yeah, I, you know, it, it'll be interesting to watch this season's drive to survive too, because, you know, in so, so not last year, but the, the year before. And, and so drive to survive is always, you know, it's showing you the behind the scenes look of what happened the previous year. Um, they're yeah. not following yeah. and you're not like getting a live look in behind the scenes while it's happening. You're getting a recap of um, the previous year. Last last year's F1 season wasn't quite as interesting as the one um, prior to it, where like it literally went down to the last couple laps of the last race. Um, I, we don't need to get into it too yeah. much, but, yeah. you know, super controversial ending um, yeah, you know, true. not let, you know, not last season, but the season before this, this previous season, the one that we're about to watch and drive to survive, not quite as compelling of storylines. Um, you know, Mercedes got off to a rocky start. Um, they started picking up a little bit of steam throughout there, but you know, and, and Ferrari had a, a, a relatively, you know, good season two. Um, Charles Leclerc had a, uh, you know, he started off strong, um, but then kind of faded. So like, I don't know. Are, 
is is it gonna are they gonna be hurt by the fact that Red Bull um and uh uh Verstappen um kind of clinched things relatively early in the season? You know, is that gonna is that gonna impact viewership at a time when they really need to up their viewership numbers? I don't know, but you know, I, I think it'll be it'll always be interesting no matter what. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I've, you know, bounced between a few of the series. And I thought, I agree with you, last season's wasn't quite as interesting. The Netflix series, not the actual racing series. Although, again, to your point, it was wrapped up relatively early. Um, I don't know. I watch, you know, F1 just because it's, to me, it's a great sport, obviously. And I watch Drive to Survive simply because I love the behind the scenes stuff. So, like, you know, we already know what happened. That's that's what I tend to like. So yeah. we'll see. It's so a you, nice appetizer. You watch the show and you're like, wow, that Christian Horner can be, uh, you know, kind of mean sometimes, you know, like yeah. you get views into, you know, what it's like to be in Formula One, um, yeah. much, much more so than just the racing side of it. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So that's coming up. And I, I honestly, I never make it through the whole series. I tend to like watch it and then I get into it and then like, you know, F1 season starts. And of course, it's March Madness and stuff like that. I tend to like, for me, it's just really good kind of like filler viewing sort of on like a Wednesday or Thursday when there's not a lot going on in the world. Uh, but then like the weekends tend to fill up with sports. So anyways, yeah, check it out. Drive to Survive. It really turned into a, a little bit of a news section there on that. But mm -hmm. we'll get to the news. Let's talk about some cars first. Uh, we're going to be electric, actually. Um, I'll just jump right in here, talk a little bit about our long-term EV6, uh, and then you can talk about an electric superbike, which I think is awesome. So um, inadvertently, we have done an all-electric review section, but um, EV6, I mean, I, do you, how are you feeling about that car? I'm curious what you think real quick before I go into a little, you know, homily, if you will. I quite like it. Um, yeah. I, I, I had our long-termer for, I don't know, something like a month. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's such a good around town car. Um, yeah. the, the range is so strong on it and the range mm -hmm. estimate is so spot on that, you know, you, you, it's not like you're, you're cons like range anxiety isn't really a thing um, with, you know, once you pass that 200 mile, um, you know, very, very few people are going to be pushing that range on a regular basis. I even drove it from um, uh, Columbus to Detroit uh, without stopping for electricity. You know, I, I obviously had to recharge before driving home. Um, but like, how often do I drive further than that? So get rid of range anxiety and just enjoy the benefits of an electric car. And the EV6 is a good electric car. Yeah, no, I think that's a good way to put it. It uh, It's one uh, multiple Car of the Year awards. It won the uh, Utility of the Year for Nactoy, of which I'm a juror, and I think that was a great call by the organization. It's it's a nice, well-rounded, like, it's got the style play. If it was an internal combustion thing, I think just on the style alone, the functionality, you could it could win on its own merits. Uh, I think it's a great design. I think the electric um, propulsion system has been good. Uh, you know, the big thing since probably I've last talked about this, and I've only had the car for a couple weeks, a couple few weeks at this point. Uh, I did charge it up at an EV go station, or excuse me, charge point station, um, pretty locally. Um, you know, it um, it was a good charge. It was funny. Another guy in an EV6 rolled up to me and was like, hey, how's your charge going? <laughs> and he was actually uh, an engineer for one of the local OEMs. I, I won't name it, but... He just was like, yeah, you know, I kind of driving around just, you know, like when I see another EV6 charging, I sometimes pull in and just say hi and yeah. stuff. So, I mean, that was kind of cool. Um, and the charge went well, if you will. I I haven't really done a fast charge of anything in a little bit just because nothing has crossed my like plate, if you will, that required as such. But it was good. It started out slow and then it really was charging at almost peak capacity and I got to 80, 81% pretty easily. Um, the hardest part of the experience was charge point just refused to take my credit card. It wouldn't let me put in my work card. I think I ended up using like Google play to get it done, which was obnoxious. And I was like, the, the, the charging is working, 
but your app is not working. Yeah. yeah. So that to me was garbage. And I think, um, you know, they, they make you use the app, which I think is also obnoxious. Like I can't just chip it or swipe my card. Like, come on, you know, that was another annoying part of just the charge point experience. Um, but overall, yeah, topped off. Um, you know, I was going to take it on a road trip, but I did did some of the research. And I was like, you know what? This is going to require multiple charge and it's going to become more of the vacation than I mm-hmm. want it to be. So mm-hmm. I didn't. Um, but I, you know, I've been driving it, you know, since we've been back and before yeah. that pretty regularly. And it's great in the snow and the slush. Like I said, it's an ice storm. So, you know, we've got all wheel drive. It has snow tires on it. It's it's working like a champion. And the, the batteries are so low to the ground in, in all of these like kind of skateboard style chassis um, mm-hmm. EVs, if you will. Um, it puts the weight down low and, you know, that's that's not to be overlooked when it comes to driving dynamics, but also mm-hmm. in, in foul weather handling. Um, it, you know, the, the point of inertia uh, makes a big, it, it's, it's a big part of the equation, I'll put it that way. Um, getting, you know, a little bit of uh, commentary on your charging experience. I've had some good charging experiences and I've had yeah. some absolutely awful charging experiences. Yeah. And it's, it's frustrating to me that I feel like the car companies have finally gotten to a point where EVs are, uh, <laughs> are viable for the majority of the population. Um, but the, tra- the, like the charging networks are just so, so much further behind. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm pretty fortunate that, um, here where I live, there's a, uh, a mire, which if, if you, if, if you're not from the part of the country that has like a mire, it's like a, you know, combined grocery and, you know, odds and ends store. It's like, a, you know, mm-hmm. the big, just a, a really big place. Um, and every mire around here has EVgo charging stations. Um, including ours and they're relatively new. Um, it's kind of a rural area, but close to an expressway. Um, so the majority of people that end up using them don't live in this town that I'm in. They're, they're passing through and it's like their stopover. Um, you know, they, they, they stop in my town just north of Columbus, Ohio, instead of, um, getting off in Columbus where it's a little bit busier. That's probably more information than our podcast readers uh, or listeners really care about. But the point that I was getting to is it's nice to have a destination charger so close to where I live that usually has charge bays available and is new enough that it supports the 350 kilowatt charging um, that, you know, a lot of a lot of electric vehicles um, can now make use of. Um, and there's a little bit of a, there's a little bit of an EV charging etiquette out there that I think, um, you know, people who don't drive electric cars or, um, have never driven an electric car would be surprised to know about. Think of like, here's a, here's one way to think of it. Um, if you go to a gas station and you've got a vehicle that runs diesel and they've only got one diesel nozzle and it's being blocked by someone who doesn't have a diesel vehicle and they're stringing the, you know, the, the gas from the neighboring station. And they just, you know, took that spot cause it was easy and convenient, but they're blocking your use of the, you know, the, the actual, you know, nozzle that you need. There's a little bit of a similar etiquette with EV charging. Um, some older electric vehicles, say gen one vehicles could charge up to say, 100 or 150 kilowatts per hour. Some of the newer ones with the, what is 800 volt architectures, um, including like our Kia EV6 uh, long-term tester can charge at over 300 kilowatts an hour. Um, so when you're pulling up to a station, some of those state or some of those plugs will only support say 150. Um, and if, and, and some of them will support 350. If you've got an EV6 and someone with an old electric vehicle is hogging the 350 kilowatt station that you'd be able to charge in 30 minutes, but they're getting no extra benefit out of it, that's irritating. You know, not as irritating as if someone's like, you know, block, blocking the EV charging stations with their big pickup truck because they've decided to make some sort of statement that they hate electric vehicles. Not that irritating, but still a little bit. There was one instance where I pulled up in our EV6 Someone had a um, uh, someone had a Mach E that was not capable of charging as fast as the EV6, 
and he's like, oh, he's like, oh, I, I'm, I'm at like 80%. He's like, do you mind if I get up to about, um, you know, 90% and then, you know, then, then I'll give you this fast charger. He's like, or, or if you're in a hurry, I'll just, you know, I'll move it over now. I'll stop this session and move it over now. He was really concerned that he was hogging the fast charger that mm -hmm. my car would charge faster on. And I was like, oh, no, no, no worries. I'm going to be in Meyer for an hour. I'm doing my grocery shopping. So, you know, it doesn't really matter. And um, I just, you know, I waited 15 minutes, um, you know, did, did a little bit of shopping, came back out, plugged in. And anyway, um, interesting, like that's an extra thing that you need to know when you've got an electric vehicle. How fast can it charge? Yeah. Which station, which plug is it that I want to, you know, plug into? The apps are supposed to show you you know, how fast a station is. Um, it's supposed to show you how many uh, plugs there are at the 150 versus 350 or, you know, what have you. They're not always reliable. They don't always work. Like you get there and, it, and it's available, but, but it's like, it says like, you know, system updating or something. Like you said, Greg, it doesn't accept your credit card. You know, you have to jump through some sort of weird hoop. I had one, it wouldn't accept payment through the app but it did take the swiping of my credit card on the actual machine. Um, you, you, so you just like, it shouldn't be unreliable. Like we should like in, in this day and age, we should be able to figure this out. And it, it's super frustrating um, that we're there on the vehicle side and not there on the charging infrastructure side. And, and I really hope it gets rectified quickly. Yeah. The last Having the last two cars I've had now are long termers, the 330E, which is just like a slow charger isn't the right way to put it, but it's just the best you can do is like a level two level charger two, with that. Yeah. There's no no level three fast charging. And then the EV6, it's really illuminated for me just the challenges and in infrastructure because I'm, I mean, candidly, I'm a big supporter of EVs right. and I think they're interesting. I think they're fun to drive. Many of them are design statements. Uh and I, I think you could, politics aside, you could take that out of the equation and just say, well, yeah, man, there, there's there's not a charger here that can charge my vehicle fast enough. And that that is a problem. And I, I'm looking forward to, I know like the state of Michigan is looking to install like a bunch of them on the 75 corridor, which I think would be awesome. If, if that were in effect now, maybe a year from now, I would have taken the EV6. You know, I would have, but it's like exactly to your point. I was like, well, okay, I, I think this is a fast charger. Pretty sure it is, but what if I get there and it's not working? Exactly. What if I, yeah, or if it's busy, you know, and it's like then, you know, if it's only a level two, that means I have to stay there for like five hours, right. which suddenly this becomes more of my vacation than I want it to be. So you know, again, that's why I didn't take it. It's not an issue. I mean, the, the EV charging part obviously is, is only relevant to electric vehicles, mm -hmm. but the same issue exists, like if, think of it this way, if you don't drive an EV, you've got a gas car, um, or let's say you've got a diesel car or whatever. Um, you, let's say you're driving from Phoenix, Arizona to Los Angeles, California, and there's a whole big long stretch of highway where there's like one gas station that you're counting on being able to fill up in you know, before you, let's say before you cross over into Indio or something like that, you pull up to the gas station and it won't accept your credit card. And they're like, well, we've got gas, but you're going to have to pay in cash. I don't have cash. You know, it's a, the same kind yeah. of frustration that you would have. Like you planned your trip. You need this piece of infrastructure to work or else your trip is over. You know, yeah. like they've got to figure it out, whether it's, you know, whether it's, upgrading the technology or the operating systems that this, this, the, the places run, um, running hardwired connections into them as opposed to, you know, a satellite connection, or if it's the hardwired issue, run satellite, like do whatever it is that you have to do. Charge me an extra dollar or two if, if that's what it costs to make this thing reliably work, but just make it reliably work. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with you. It's, um, you know, like you, I've had a Meyer experience because there's one, you know, somewhat near me that has a whole bank of chargers, which is great. Um, it's just, it's it's tricky, you know. Um, I actually went to the supermarket yesterday and there was a Volta charger. And I was like, cool, never <laughs> used a Volta charger before. And there was, this is hilarious. There was a, 
Maserati parked in one of the spots that was not a plug Obviously in. Obviously, not a like, plug in, yeah. Yeah. But I looked at the sign and it was like, these are not launched yet. Like they're installed, but they're not working. Ah, gotcha. So I just parked there and I was like, oh man, I was hoping to get like, you know, kind of top off during yeah. this like 45 minute shopping. That, and that's not even an infrastructure thing. The infrastructure in this case is literally getting there, which is a great thing. It just wasn't there yet. The other thing, if, if you're th- listening to this podcast and, you know, you're thinking, um, you know, well, this reinforces my dislike of electric vehicles, hearing them talk about that. Just remember, this is this is one use case that we're talking about here. Um, the vast, like if I had that EV6 and it was my car that I was driving every single day, I would plug it in in my driveway or in my garage every night. Yeah, and exactly. every day I'd leave with... 225, 240, whatever mm-hmm. the range was, miles yep. in the tank that day. I would never have to plug it into any, well, not never, only have to worry about this um, charging infrastructure on trips. Mm-hmm. The, the, the vast majority of your charging, um, if you live in a home that you can put a charger in, is going to be on your home charger. And, and yeah. we did some math on the rates too, um, if, if you're concerned about uh, how much it costs. It is so much cheaper to put electrons in batteries than it is to put gas in tanks. Mm-hmm. Like I, I could fill the thing up in off hours. It was like six bucks worth of worth of uh, electricity on my um, on my meter for two hundred and forty miles of range the next wow. day. I mean, th- that's how cheap it is when you're charging mm-hmm. at home. Like it it it's so so much more energy efficient. Uh, and and lower lower payment um, than than gasoline is. Yeah, I got fifty seven kilowatt hours. Uh, it took me forty seven minutes to do it, but that includes like a really slow start because it was really cold, uh, and it was ten fifty two. So you know, I basically got from twenty ish percent to about eighty percent. And to your point, this isn't like a indictment on like EVs or something. It's more like the the road trip element right, of it right like if i were just like just driving around town it's it's not a problem yeah i just do if i get low i go to this fast charger that is nearby i top off and i'm good you know it's a good place to catch up on work emails drink some coffee it's not a problem for I, me yeah i'm gonna an- anecdotally end on an experience that my wife had the other day that she was complaining um well we were talking on the phone she stopped to get gas she gets in the car. We're talking. We're talking. We're talking. Now she's she's driving a Chevy Suburban or a GMC Suburban with a forty two gallon tank, you know. So this is a really really large gas tank. Um, mm-hmm. This particular gas station pump was just moving excruciatingly slow. Yeah. Um, you know, everyone's gotten. You know, everyone's you know put put the nozzle in their tank and they're like, why is this taking so? It was just like just crawling. And I don't know if it was mm-hmm. a low pressure situation, if they you know were having a hard time with their pump or whatever. Um, but it, we were talking on the phone for like nearly 20 minutes before it finally hit the full point of that 42 gallon tank. So wow. it's, you know, like I have to think that let's say, let's say in the 1930s when, you know, when when vehicles were let's let's change that let's say the 50s when you know post-war america people are putting you know pretty much everyone's got a gasoline running vehicle in their garages now there are probably a lot of these snafus that if there were podcasts back then we could retroactively listen to where people would be complaining that oh the texaco station you know they, they they finally put one in but you know there's not enough Etc. Like it's an infrastructure issue that will eventually be solved mm-hmm. um, because car companies are selling these vehicles. They're not going anywhere. So they're eventually going to get to a point where, you know, we'll have the coverage and reliability that, you know, that, that will make this a moot point. Hopefully that happens sooner rather than later. It reminds me of, to your point of like doing a podcast, trying to talk about like when Eisenhower was trying to lay out the interstate highway system in like the 50s or like some of the public works things with FDR in like the 30s. Like, you know, we really are on the, like just the, the beginning of yep. this, yep. you know. We're on the cusp so. of something great. Yeah. So let's talk about electric motorcycles. Yeah. Uh, tell me about the one you were. You were in the Super 73 S2. What a great name. Yeah. So the Super 73 S2, actually it's, um, it is on two wheels, but it's more of a like moped style than, okay. than motorcycle. 
Um, this week, Zero Motorcycles actually put a concept out. Um, okay. It's it's the SRX concept. Um, okay. And check if you're listening to this. Definitely, if you like motorcycles, definitely check Autoblog um, for the story. It ran on February 22nd. Um, it's a concept bike, and it's absolutely amazing. That's not the bike that I had this week, or, or not um, this week, but recently. Um, what I had was the Super 73 S2. Um, it is, you know, I got thing up to about 30 miles an hour. Um, it does have pedals, but you definitely cannot pedal that fast. Um, it's had a pretty sizable battery. Um, you know, I got, uh, I, I never had, I never had to, to recharge it during the entire week that, um, that I was riding the thing. Um, I, I don't have like numbers in front of me. Um, but I'd say I probably got, um, I kept the thing, I kept the, the throttle pinned pretty much nonstop. And I put uh, 10 miles or so on it in the week that I had it. And I still had over half a charge left. So, you know, you can kind of do your own math there. Um, but I think it's interesting how many more people are looking at electric bicycles um, as that, you know, People used to use the term final mile. I don't think that really is an appropriate term these days, but like the alternative to firing up my, you know, my, my suburban with its big V8 engine, if I'm just running around the corner to, you know, oh, I'm out of coffee cream or, you know, I want to, um, I'm going to meet, you know, meet a friend at, you know, X restaurant that's, you know, five miles away, whatever. Those are, those are all things that I did with the, with the bike, you know, during the, the period that I had it. Um, and they, they, they work so well for that. I threw a backpack on, um, and you know, that, that gave me plenty of room for you know, a little grocery run. Um, and yeah, just, it's a really, really great platform for, um, for around town city riding in streets that, you know, have a, 25 to 35 mile an hour um, speed limit. You're keeping up with traffic. You're not a nuisance, and there's plenty of range. Um, just a, a really, a really positive experience um, to, to you know to the point where I think like, yeah, I would like one of these things parked in my garage, um, and I would I would use this a lot. Like there's a lot of uses for these little electric bikes, and and the one that I had is not terribly expensive. A um, couple thousand dollars uh, would easily pay for itself in uh, gasoline um, if you've got a big suburban like mine over the course of a couple years. Um, and it makes you feel good that you are using a vehicle that's right sized for the purpose as opposed to, you know, firing up your, your, you know, your, your gasoline powered vehicle unnecessarily. Um, so I get the appeal. I get why people are buying them. I get why it's such a... Um, it's a category of vehicle that's expanding so quickly with new players. My one piece of advice, if you are shopping for an electric bike, I tested the uh, Super 73 S2, did not have rear suspension. It had front suspension. Mm. It's only a couple hundred dollars more to get the upgraded model that has rear suspension on it. And you want it. You definitely, that's money well spent. Um, it is a big old padded seat. But I hit a couple potholes at 30, you know, 25, 30 miles an hour that, you know, gave me like a little bit of a, ooh, you know, that's, I haven't done that since I was a teenager, you know, um, moment. Uh, so yeah, spring for the rear suspension if you are, uh, if you're doing the shopping yourself. This is a sweet looking thing. I, if for one thing, if I called it a motorcycle earlier, it's, it's not, but it, it does kind of look like one. It's moped-ish, uh, yeah. Moped-ish. It's got a good look. Um, Looks like it is uh, about thirty three hundred bucks. Yeah, uh, grand. Looks good. Uh, you can get it, and I'm just going through the configurator here. It looks good in literally all colors: bone white, bone uh, white is what I had. Okay, the green looks pretty gnarly too. I like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's a cool looking bike. I mean, I think this is uh, to your point. I could see how, like, knowing a little bit about the area in which you live. I could see how this could work really well for you. And it's it, aesthetically, it looks awesome. Yeah, I, I, I had so, kind of old school. I know. Yeah, very old school. I had so many people give me thumbs up on this thing. Mm. It was surprising, actually, 
how many people like stopped and looked and, you know, they, they could realize that I was on an electric bike, but it didn't look like a dorky electric bike. Like it looks pretty cool. It's very stylish, kind of a flat track handlebar, kind of the, um, the flat top puffy seat, like seventies moped style. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, very, very cool and definitely recommended. So it looks like it's 20 mile an hour, uh, 20 miles an hour plus top speed, they say. Yeah. Uh, that's 40 to 75 miles of range. Yeah. So let me, let me get, spill the beans on that. Um, yeah. it, it comes with an instruction manual. It pull it right out of the box and it's, it's uh, software locked to 20 miles an hour. Um, the, that's like beginner riding mode. Yeah. Most, most municipalities have like a, a tiered system of, um, of electric bike, like, or moped even capabilities. So like five, five brake horsepower or less vehicles. Um, a lot of areas cap the top speed at 28 miles an hour. They say, we don't want you going faster than 28. Well, the super 73 team is so you, you can pull it out of beginner mode and put it into like the advanced mode, um, immediately. There's also a completely unlocked mode. Um, did I test it in unlocked mode? Well, it's my job to test it in unlocked mode. Of course, did I take it out of unlocked mode after testing? No, I did not. Uh, you know, you can, you can back off the throttle a little bit to, um, to stay legal of that 28 uh, mile an hour limit. Um, but I found some, uh, some parks with big, um, open areas and I got the thing, um, you know, 31, 32, 33 miles per hour, um, on, on flat level ground. Um, but even at that 28, um, software lock speed, you're basically keeping up with, um, you know, with around town traffic in, in like regular roads, even if they've got a 35 mile an hour, uh, speed limit and you're not quite going that you're also not holding anybody up. Um, okay. so yeah, it, it, it really works pretty well. For 3,300 bucks, this to me seems like kind of a good deal. Like it's not like, yeah. I mean, you draw you wrote it. So yeah, I, like yeah. I said, I would bump up to it's, it's a couple hundred bucks more, but they've got models with rear suspension. Um, mm. if you're spending 3,300 spend 37 or 38 and get the rear suspension, your, you know, your backside and lower back will, uh, thank you for it later. Okay. Sounds good. Um, cool. And well, full, full review coming soon, uh, to coming soon. autoblog.com. Um, yeah, I shot some, some photos, some, um, I've got a write up coming. Uh, so yeah, check, check out what, a what I have to say about it. Can't wait to read it. Can't wait to see the pictures too. I think that's, that's, you know, bikes like this are really, I'm not a rider, but it's in my, in my alley, if yeah, you will. So sure. I like the vibe. So, uh, should we run some, run through some news here? Absolutely. All right, let's, let's do it. Um, do, do, do. I have got a little bit of an audible. I just saw this. I will throw it on here. I'll lead off and you can tell me what you think. So we're kind of doing it live. Lordstown stopped production and they're doing a recall of like a relatively small amount of their uh, trucks. They've only made a relatively small amount. That's the uh, endurance pickup truck. That's right. Yeah. Um, due to, and I'm reading the wire story here, performance and quality issues with some components. So, um, yeah, check out the story. It's it's on Autoblog. They put in some paperwork with NHTSA, and obviously this the stock hit eight percent down, as you would say. And they're going to voluntarily recall nineteen vehicles, um, which I mean, frankly, their goal was to deliver fifty last year, according to Reuters. And then um, their first batch is going to be about five hundred. So um, this is surprising. I mean, actually, no, I shouldn't say that. It's not surprising. Um, these things happen with every automaker. Um, you know, right now, it doesn't sound great. It doesn't sound like the worst thing in the world, but it will be interesting to see how this plays out in the coming days. How big of a problem is it? How quick can they fix it? And can they get back to their production targets? So yeah. we'll see. Yeah, this, I, I, I just looked it up, Greg. Um, on Reuters, it says that yeah. they've made 31 units, and, and we'll get this up on Autoblog too. You'll be able to read it there. They've yeah. made uh, 31 units, um, citing performance and quality issues with some components, as you said. That is so nebulous. That can mean yeah. anything. You know, like 
did, did is it the the seat back adjusters are locking and mm-hmm. it's causing you know an issue that they've got to fix we don't know what that means um so obviously more to come on that echoing what you said it's not surprising to me that a company like Lordstown would have teething issues getting the you yeah. know getting their vehicles out um I'll have to wait and see exactly what the problems are here. I can tell you that I have visited that plant, um, done a full factory tour. Um, Where they're building them is a great factory. They've got well-qualified people designing, engineering, assembling them. I don't think, you know, did they maybe get it rushed into production a little bit to try to hit their numbers and targets and please investors? Maybe, um, but you know, I, I really hope that this isn't like some sort of death knell for the company and, you know, it, it ends up leading to uh, demise or anything because um, yeah, they got a cool product. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, it's different than everything else. Um, you know, I mean, think of it this way. When Tesla first launched, there were, Elon Musk himself has said that they were, you know, within days of bankruptcy several times yeah. in their infancy. Every company, every startup, small company producing, uh, you know, trying to mass produce and um, a product as, as sophisticated and complicated as a four wheeled vehicle um, with all of today's modern safety requirements and, um, you know, to, to be able to compete with the likes of, say, Ford um, with its lightning pickup with their um, with their startup. Um, it's hard. Uh, mm-hmm. So not surprising. Um, hopefully it doesn't turn into too big of a, a debacle. Yeah, it's to your point, this is par for the course for startups and for everybody. I mean, we just did a story about Ford recalling the Mustang, the Explorer and the F-150, which I believe the newest of those vehicles they've been building is the Explorer since the 90s. Broncos, like two Broncos. Broncos, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not like Ford doesn't know how to build cars. They've been doing for 110 whatever years, 120 years. So again, it's a common problem but again it's it's tough when it's a newer company the problem here doesn't seem to be like super reported out let's put it that way so we'll kind of withhold judgment there um it's kind of weird not weird but it's interesting both you and i have driven these trucks i drove yeah. a production model and you drove very much more pre-pro bare pre-pro, bones one pre-pro, a couple yeah. years ago mm-hmm. i liked it generally i didn't get a long time in it um so it's like it's very hard for me to write a big extensive review on it. Right. Uh, it's tough on price. I do feel like one of the things that's helped them is Ford keeps raising the prices of the yeah. F-150 Lightning. Yeah. Before it was just such a screaming deal, you were like, well, why would you buy the startup electric truck from a right. company you've never heard of when Ford will sell you one for 20 grand less? Yeah. Ford's definitely coming back to the pack with that. I yeah, think the field is, yeah. So I we'll can see. I can speak, I can actually speak to that a little bit. I I tried my darndest to find one of those low priced uh, Ford F-150 Lightnings, like the the ones, what is it? They call it the pro model or something like that. It's the ones it's like, yeah. it's, it's, it's stripped of like a lot of the consumer friendly content, but the basic truck package is the same. Um, and they were selling them for like 50 grand, 48 to 53, something like that. And I was like, heck yeah, I'll take one of those. I tried so hard to find one mm. within hundreds of miles of me, um, impossible. It, either mm. like a dealer had one and they were just completely unwilling to sell it at the price that Ford stickered it at, or there were a line of a dozen people um, ahead of me saying, I'll take it. You know, there's, it's, and, and now that truck doesn't exist at that price anymore. Like it was, it, they didn't, I think Ford probably didn't know just how to price the vehicle. And that, so they came in at a point mm-hmm. where people were like, okay, that's compelling. And it was so compelling that Ford was like, Ooh, we got a, we got too much demand for this thing. Obviously people are willing to pay more for it. So they jacked the price up by like yeah. li- literally like $20,000 from what was initially um, or something close to fifteen, twenty thousand dollars that what it was like yeah. initially launched at. Um, and they're still selling for over sticker price. Um, a friend of mine got a, a loaded out one. Um, what's the top spec platinum? Maybe is that yeah. what it is? Yeah. Um, he had to uh, drive with the trailer um, in his other pickup truck all the way to North Dakota from Ohio. 
um, mm. just to just to get one within like a reasonable time frame. Um, so so yeah, getting back to how this relates to Lordstown, um, at first I my I was totally in agreement with you. Like, why would you take a flyer on this you know startup electric truck company? You know, they, they've got a cool product. I like the ideas behind it. I like where, where they're going with this. Um, and, you know, it, like, I'd have to spend a week with one to really, like, draw a conclusion and, and how I feel, like, does it really stack up or not? But if they're able to maintain that fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 price range that Ford has now basically abandoned with the Lightning, they might have a little bit of a niche there um, that, mm -hmm. that, that could potentially be survivable. Even Rivian um, has mm -hmm. dramatically increased its pricing um, since, you know, the vehicles were first, yeah. you know, up for, for reservation. Um, so we'll see what happens with Lordstown. I'll just put it this way. I'm pulling for them. I really hope that they're able to make a, a success out of it. Um, it would be very disappointing um, if, you know, it turns into a, you know, kind of a Fisker situation where they've got this like kind of neat, compelling product, but things just don't go their way. And it's a one year, one model year only kind of thing. Like, yeah. I hope that that doesn't happen with Lordstown. Original Fisker. The original clear. Fisker. Yeah. Now it's, now it's karma. Yeah. yeah. And now it's karma. Yeah. And there's a new Fisker, which is a whole topic for another conversation because they've announced yeah. a whole bunch of products and not a single one of them is actually purchasable at the moment so anyway no, that's true that's true uh it's tough to make cars yeah. um you know i did reading a little bit more it apparently the the issue is an electrical connection issue that could result in a loss of propulsion while driving so that's the issue uh reading the reuters story um we'll, we'll keep you posted you know yeah. we are it's funny so if you're listening to this on i don't know friday evening you're opening a beer on your patio saturday whatever you're doing it's like Thursday afternoon. It's a little later than we record the podcast, actually, to let you behind the curtain here. And we're just, I was just sort of scrambling the jets. We had a Slack conversation going. I was letting people know, hey, we want to get this up on the site now. This is a this is a big deal. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, it'll be up there by the time you're there and maybe we'll have a follow-up. Yeah. But um, yeah, I liked driving it. It was fun. It looks good. You know, it's a work truck, but it's it's pretty, unique. It's, it's unique. unique. I agree. Yeah. Um, Reminds me of a Ridgeline a little bit. A little bit, yeah. The, it was a, in that it is a different take on a traditional yep. concept. Yeah. So um, it's if a you're good not, thing, I think. Yeah, I agree. There's there's plenty of room for diversity in the automotive industry. There's um, Lordstown. If you're not familiar with it, designed this pickup truck. It's got four individual motors, one at each wheel. So there's no traditional transmission. There's no traditional drive shaft that runs like the length of the vehicle, and it's it. It both complicates things um, because they've got a whole bunch of electrical connections and, you know, maybe it's not too surprising that that's what Reuters is saying the trouble could be with. They've got, you know, high voltage wiring running to every corner of the car now, not just to one specific, you know, front motor, or rear motor or what have you. Um, but it, it, it's, it, it's a little bit complicated, but it's also much more simple in another way in that there's a lot less like kind of rotating mass in various spots of the vehicle that traditional drivetrains like, you know, axles, drive shafts, transmissions, transfer cases, the endurance, the Lordstown endurance doesn't have to have any of those things. Um, and yet it's still a four wheel drive um, truck with, you know, fully capable of sending as much or as little possible to any of those four wheels, like, you know, like a very high end, um, uh, tr you know, kind of more traditional system might do. It does it in a much more simple manner, um, but it's also new and untested. So probably not terribly surprising that it's got kinks. Yeah. No, I mean, we'll just see. It's, it's very, you know, these things happen. Yeah. Sometimes they work up, sometimes they don't. Their response so, to it is, is what's going to, you know, yeah. that's going to be the real story here. It's not, yeah. I don't think the story at this point is they had an issue with it. The story yeah. is going to be how do they fix it and, you know, what do they what is it what happens to their bottom line because of it? That's that's going to yeah. be the follow up. All right. So that's Lordstown, a little bit of an audible there. Let's uh let's run through a few other news items and we'll, you know, we'll close this thing out here. All uh, right. It's a good show. The 
is it the frat zonic? How do you say that? That's I, I, how, yeah, that's how they were, they're were, they were calling it like the frat zonic or something like that. Yeah. Frat zonic, maybe I'm emphasizing the front syllable too much. Yeah, sound check. That's our headline. This is the sound of electric cars, an electric charger. What do you think? It is interesting. Um, yeah. Like, how to describe what the what the system even is? If you know anything about uh, your your orchestral instruments, picture a wind instrument, a tuba, a trombone, something to that effect. Dodge uh, has literally made a like tube shaped instrument of sorts and a vibrating, reverberating kind of mechanism at one end and an open horn shape at the other end. And what they're doing, and, and basically with that kind of like instrument, so to speak, they're able to make any number of sounds. So what they're doing now, it, it, so, so they're saying, yeah, one of the cool things about cars is that they make this noise. You know, especially, you know, people are big on their Hemi Mopars, you know, like their SRT8s with the burbly exhaust. Um, so what what uh, Dodge is saying is like, hey, you don't have to give up that that cool sound of a car. Um, but what they're doing now is tuning it. So, you know, I've got a piano in my uh, in, in my room downstairs every several years. You know, somebody comes in and they have their little tool kit and they they tune the piano to make sure that the the noises that it's making is just right. Well, Dodge is doing that right now behind the scenes. Um, they keep retuning it, slightly changing this vibration, slightly changing, you know, I, I'm making these things up, but like the thickness of the metal of the horn, the, you know, the slight shape of it, like every little change that they make um, results in a slightly different sound emanating from the back of this electric vehicle. Do you want that at all is the first question you have to ask. And if the answer is, yes, I do want that, what do you want it to sound like? So Dodge has decided they're answering that first one for you. You want it. Now what they're doing is tuning it to make it sound exactly like what they think an electric super performance car should sound like. Um, and it's going through many different iterations. I've heard it a couple times. Um, they had one out at SEMA. Um, and they, they keep working on it. They're, they're looking for feedback. Um, and it just, you know, it just keeps until they finally put it into production, they can continue making changes on it, um, changes to it and keep refining the sound that they're, they're, they're trying to emanate from the back of this car. It's very Dodge take on electric things. I think it's a good thing. I think everybody's going to have a different take on, uh, how their electric cars look, feel, sound. So I, it's kind of cool, you it's, know. Like it's interesting. Like if you stop and and just sit back and think about, like, let's say that you answered the question, "Yes, I want my electric vehicle to make some sort of cool sound." There's a lot of ways you can go about that. Yeah. Um, for instance, Tesla put speakers on their cars, and they let people plug in sounds of their own um, to a very irritating effect, um, in a lot of people's opinions. Dodge is doing it completely differently. And they're saying like, you know, we're going to make this part of our electric DNA and we're going to do it through not speakers. We're literally going to make an instrument that this electric car is playing and sounding like. It is a very Dodge take on things. Like um, even going back to the 1960s, you know, Dodge Mopar, um, so Dodge Plymouth Chrysler, they had very interesting takes on, you know, the muscle car era um, you know, the, the, the classic Roadrunner Me, Me Porn being a prime example. Um, but, you know, the way that they name their cars, the colors that they paint them, they have like a little bit of an irreverence to them. And this almost seems like, like an extension of that. Like, yeah, we're, we're, we don't want to be kicking and screaming and dragging our feet into the electric age. So what are we going to do that like says, okay, we're going electric, we're going performance, but we're also tipping our hat to, you know, our heritage customers that, that, that want something unique and different. And this is one of the ways that they decided they're going to do it. So I'm going to just hit play on the video in our story. I have no idea if some like ad is going to play. So, but we'll just try it. 
listeners, I apologize if this doesn't sound right, but let's just see. Easiest thing is to play it. Let's see what happens. And oh, there it is. It did play. If you didn't, if that didn't come through, and I don't know, maybe we'll edit that out. We'll see how it goes. But if you didn't hear, it, just head on over to uh, the story. It's easy to find. Again, I mean, just if you told me that's how it sounds, I like the sound. So, yeah, I'm I'm torn. Like, I like the idea of the sound that I'm hearing out of an SRT8 or a Hellcat is the sound of the internal combustion engine. And but I mean, the flip side of that is the exhaust that we've trained ourselves to to recognize is also highly tuned. Yeah, that's you know, true. That's a it, fair point. It, it's it's totally true. Like there's entire engineering departments that design the exhaust systems on these, you know, Dodge basically, you know, crazy muscle cars. Like they they've been doing this for years. They've been tuning them. There's no engine, there's an instrument now, but it's just like I don't know, it's kind of an extension of what their audio engineering department has been doing since, you know, internal combustion first started. All right. So let's talk about electric vehicles again on mm. panels. This is an interesting thing. I think Ford is uh, considering they showed this basically. And instead of like one of the things when you're driving an EV, you get better range if uh, you turn down the air conditioning or the heat. That also means you got to really drive with like layers on or with the windows down, which can also arrow impact, you know, how your, your, your fuel mileage or fuel electric mileage range is. So basically what Ford is suggesting is, you know, making the, the panels inside the car like warm, if you will. And I think this is kind of cool. It's just a, it's like a demonstration sort of thing. Um, and you know, some cars do offer this already in like a limited fashion on like, they're more like luxury cars. Uh, BMW, I drove one that did that. Uh, I'm pretty sure Mercedes has done that as well. So I think this is a really good idea. I also like to be warm and toasty when I drive. So I already like this idea. Uh, but I think for EVs, there's a lot of potential. We'll see, you know. It is interesting. Um, so... It's a conundrum because the heat that you get out of an internal combustion engine is waste heat. Mm -hmm. It would be it would be doing nothing if it didn't serve to warm up the cabin. That's not the case with electric vehicles. They need a heat source of they need a separate heat source and it has to come from the battery. Um, no one at this point is better than Tesla at managing properly the heat that the electric batteries the motor, everything, you know, both produces and requires. Um, Greg mentioned earlier when he was talking about the EV6, like, oh, the battery started charging a little bit slow because it was super cold outside. Well, that's because the batteries have to condition. They have to get up to a certain um, internal temperature before you can really start pounding electricity into them. Um, Tesla's got this like super crazy technology where they've got this, it's like an eight-way valve or something like that. Um, it's, it's like an engineering marvel from my engineering friends who, who, you know, talk about these kinds of things. Um, I don't totally get every aspect of it. Um, but it's like, it's the world's best heat management system for electric vehicles. What Ford is saying is, you know, Hey, we've got this other idea about, you know, how to generate heat, how to manage heat, how to make sure that the interior is getting up, up to temperature. Is it going to be as efficient as Tesla's way? I don't know. Um, it doesn't surprise me that Ford is thinking about this um, and, you know, coming up with new ways and issuing press releases to make sure we know that it's something that they're working on. I think that's great. Um, you know, eventually everyone, every car company will settle on, you know, their own methods of, of, of how to do it. But even as far back as the initial Chevy Bolt with a B, uh, not Volt with a V, but B, 
I, I don't even know if that's clear on uh, in, in the podcast. Bolt, as in B, the second letter of the alphabet. Um, when they launched that vehicle, they made a big deal about talking how um, it's much more efficient to heat the person than to heat the ambient air of the uh, vehicle. And they made um, like, you know, whole dashboard displays and, and like graphics showing you like, oh, if you turn your heated seat on, it's only going to reduce your range by X amount, as opposed to if you set your internal cabin temperature at 75. And for us to maintain that temperature, it's going to reduce your range by, you know, this amount, it's much more efficient to heat the person and make them comfortable than it is to heat the air inside the vehicle. This is another way that Ford's doing that. They're, it's, it's like, they're, like, think of it this way. They're talking about take, turning, you know, panels inside your car into little itty bitty radiators. Um, they're giving off heat and, you know, it's just like if you packed, uh, you know, if you have every seat full in your car, um, people are giving off 98.6 degrees of body heat and it, it's, you know, the, the car's gonna, the interior's gonna heat up faster because of that, as opposed to if you're driving alone. That's kind of like the same principle here. Ford is saying it's gonna heat up these bits and pieces and it's going to increase the ambient temperature inside the vehicle. Hopefully it's sufficient. You know, I think, I think that's, that's cool. That's cool that they're working on it. Cool. Could be an either or thing too. Not an either or, but in a, a both and type yeah, of situation, right. you know, so. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So Pininfarina Batista is the fastest car in the world, according to some metrics. Uh, yeah. This is one tests that were done uh, in India uh, with uh, the car magazine auto car, uh, they, they staged a couple tests here, quarter mile and half mile, and you put up some pretty fast numbers. Sure I did. think for me, the interesting move here is just that like Pininfarina, it, the, I, for a while there, they were almost like, you know, they were in some rough shape, you know, and they're, they've kind of pivoted from being like this quasi in-house design arm for Ferrari to really like, they've really expanded what they do. They're you, you could argue the car says pin and farina, although it's got a lot of different things going on with it to making cars. To me, this is the records are cool. Um, records are always cool, whether on the Nürburgring or Guinness or you name it. Um, but to me, this is kind of cool evidence that they could, you know, sort of create with a little bit of help from others, you know, very credible, very fast uh, supercar. Uh, I'd love to drive the Batista. I think it would be amazing. Yeah, totally. And some of the most beautiful cars in the world um, have been designed by Pininfarina. Um, it goes back, um, oh, since 1930, it says that it was founded. Yeah. Um, interesting that they are doing this. And, and here's why I say that. The Pininfarina Batista underneath, it, it, it runs drivetrain components designed and manufactured by um how do you say it rim is it rimac i think it's that yeah we'll say we'll sure yeah that's croatian the croatian electric car company that um that is now teamed up and partnered up with bugatti um and rimac is one of the premier electric drivetrain um manufacturers in the world um, they provide, they provide the guts of a lot of the world's most powerful, fastest, um, both on road and, uh, on racetracks. They provide a lot of the stuff that makes them go, including the drivetrain for the Pit and Farina, uh, Batista. Um, prior to this record, the Rimac, uh, what is it? The, the Nevera, is that what they called mm -hmm. it? Um, yeah. that's the vehicle that held the record. Um, interesting that Pininfarina went to India, um, and set these records. Um, Pininfarina is tra uh, traditionally an Italian company. That's where it was, uh, founded. That's where it's headquartered, but it's owned by Mahindra, the Indian, um, manufacturing powerhouse, um, make a lot of tractors. They, they make some very Jeep looking off-road vehicles. Um, and they are, they're the money behind, uh, Pin and Farina right now. Um, Pin and Farina partnered up, as we said, with Rim Rimac for 
the, the powertrain, the acceleration numbers of the Batista are just like a tenth better or you know, a, a, a fraction of a second quicker um, than the numbers that uh, were published with uh, the RIMAC. Um, how does how does RIMAC feel about that? That's like the obvious question. Like, are they going to be, um, are, are they going to say like, oh, good for them, you know, uh, great, great job. Or are they going to throw even stickier tires on the Nevera and reset another record? Um, that'd be my guess. I don't, I don't think that this record's going to stand for forever. Um, regardless, we're splitting hairs here. These are the, like, you know, couple these up as, as like, um, they're obviously different vehicles. One of them is a Pininfarina Batista, one is a Rimac Nevera. Um, but, you know, couple them up. They are the fastest vehicles in the world that, you know, happen to be powered by electricity. But regardless, they're just like, we're talking insane acceleration numbers. Yeah. No, it's, uh, you know, Rimac does some interesting things. It's usually this is the time of year when we'd see like the latest version of whatever they're working on at the Geneva Motor Show right. uh, within a couple of weeks or so. So they're always, uh, you know, a company that I think is really, um, they can do pretty cool things. They're extremely you know, for, impressive. Yeah. And yeah. young too. Like uh -huh. how quickly they've gone from like startup to like teamed up with Bugatti um yeah. is is like it's mind-boggling like that's a great point yeah. yeah how successful they've been how quickly they've done it all right then we'll file this under boring but important the opposite of i guess the batista is iihs top picks and there's actually some changes this year which is perhaps more interesting the list of the latest top safety pick and top safety pick plus is now out again go to the website we're not going to read the whole thing um, but fewer cars made it this year because of a couple of changes. And then I know your voice is about done, so I'll toss it over to you. What do you think? And then I will read all of the spend my money and you can take a breath. Yeah, Go sure. Ahead. Yeah, no, no problem. And again, I apologize to all of our uh, listeners. Yeah. My, my voice is a little bit hoarse today. Um, <sighs> car safety is not a sexy topic to talk about. Um, it's important. It's important. Yeah. It's not like we don't, we don't devote a huge amount of time in the auto blog podcast very often to talk about vehicle safety. Obviously it's extremely important as a purchasing decision. Um, so Greg and I were talking about this a little bit earlier. I'm sure everyone listening to this has had this thought in their head or have at least heard it from someone else. Why are cars constantly getting bigger? Why are cars constantly getting heavier? Why are they so much more expensive? Why is the cost continue, you know, going up? Safety is one of the biggest factors driving that. Today's cars are orders of magnitude safer than, than, than what they have been in previous years. Companies like the IIHS, they are, they are financially incentivized to want to improve vehicle safety because IIHS stands for Insurance Institute of highway safety. And yes, it is funded by car insurance companies that want to, you know, they, they want vehicles to be safer, both for capitalistic reasons, because it's better for their bottom line um, in payouts, um, but also furthering safety is a noble prospect, um, no matter how you slice it. So here's why it's important. They're, they're, Every, every couple of years, um, IAHS revises their safety ratings because car companies get to a point where they're really good at hitting the numbers that they're, um, that, that they, that they've been, not numbers, the bogeys that they've been given. Um, so you start seeing a whole bunch of vehicles get the same safety rating, the best rating. Um, I'll read this directly out of our report. It says, with last year's testing, 101 vehicles earned uh, awards. Now just 48 do with the new ones, and only 28 of them are top safety pick plus, which is the highest. So what they're doing is adding additional safety aspects and elements to their previous awards that make them harder to hit and therefore technically more safe. Um, more safe in a very narrow, you know, specific rating type in this case there's um headlight or not headlights but um 
um, night safety of automated technologies and side impact, I believe, are the, are the two things that were um, marginally made more difficult to hit. But what we're going to see happen is eventually the car companies are going to hit these bogeys and all the new vehicles are going to hit those numbers. And four or five years from now, something new, you know, some new wrinkle will be thrown in and they'll call the herd again and the car companies will go back to the drawing board. Every time this happens, a little bit of expense, a little bit of size, a little bit of something, um, a piece of technology is going to have to be added to the vehicle to make it hit this new safety, you know, plateau. So, so that's why it's important. You know, it, it's not like, you know, and everybody's like, oh, did you see that new Mustang? Yeah, five-star safety rating. You know, that's not the kind of thing that we talk about, um, but it's extremely important. And it's, it's one of the driving factors of current vehicle design is, you know, cars are, are bigger, faster, um, and fortunately safer than they ever have been before unfortunately that also makes them more expensive um and heavier you know things that are that are not so desirable but you know that's that's kind of the way that these things progress yeah no that that's a good analysis of you know how this is kind of shaking out uh and i think it does matter to consumers because a lot of people like you like to know hey oh it's an iihs top safety pick Safety Pick Plus, you know, and when I was doing some car buying research, you know, a while ago, I sort of rationalized the purchase of one car because it's like, well, it's not this, but it's mainly because of, I think it was the headlights at the time. And that was, you might remember a few years ago, the headlights were a big drawback for a lot of different cars. They just, you know, they didn't, they weren't bright enough or didn't see far enough or whatever it was. They were newer vehicles with technology on headlights from years ago. So we just were seeing fewer, fewer top picks, if you will. And if companies so. like IHS don't um, don't make car companies respond to these new ratings, the car companies aren't just going to magically take it upon themselves to come out with this really high tech new lighting technology that really does improve your ability to see at night. Yeah. Like they've kind of got to be prodded into doing it. That's yeah. That's like the the other aspect of this, like. You know, my 93 Suburban, it doesn't have great exterior lights. You know, there's not a whole lot I can do about it. The car that I buy, you know, the brand new Suburban that I buy um, on the, the the dealership floor right now has much, much better headlights. Yeah. And the reason is because these standards keep evolving over time. You know, that that is the march of progress. All right. So speaking of our personal cars. Let's spend some money here. Um, Dave in Phoenix writes, Hey guys, I wrote back in September 2021 and asked about a sporty crossover to replace his beloved 2015 Lexus IS350 F Sport. Unfortunately, the IS350 was rear-ended and totaled. Everybody's okay. So that's good to hear. Uh, This is a little bit after the fact. This is almost like a mailbag question too. So uh, they ended up getting a 2023 BMW X3 xDrive 30i graphite exterior, red kind of burgundy interior. Uh, He likes it. It's fun to drive. Best infotainment in class, he says. Uh, They actually had two different vehicles coming in within the week. So he had a choice and he paid sticker, MSRP. So this is kind of a rare experience I'm hearing Mm -hmm. in the car buying segment. Um, This is just sort of his dealership experience. They looked at an Acura RDX uh, with the super handling all wheel drive. Um, they only had a front wheeler to test none in stock six weeks to order. And it was $3,000 over sticker, uh, with some other stuff that he wasn't interested in. A Mercedes GLC 300, no new models, um, let alone new generation. That's true. That is coming out. Um, only return service loaners with about three to five grand on the, 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 the mules, we'll call them the test mules. Um, so he was like, yeah, we'll pass on that. I agree. <laughs> um, the Lexus NX350 F Sport performance, he says, longest name ever. Uh, there's some longer ones, but it's, it doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. This is impressive. According to Dave, there were none in stock. They could not order them as the allocated cars to dealer. It sounds like we're already gone. Two month wait for a vehicle. Uh, long story short, oh, and it was 3300 bucks over sticker. Um, so sounds like Dave liked it, but he couldn't. Mm-hmm. The, Justify uh, the, it. For sure. So we got the Bimmer at sticker. 
had a couple to choose from. Um, I think that was a good call. I think, frankly, yeah. even looking at the field, if every, all things being equal, I would have leaned pretty hard onto that X3 as it is. Um, second part of this is he's asking is because BMW does have factories in the United States, does this help them with the supply situation? Um, so again, like I said, two parts here. My first part is good call, Dave. Hope you like the X3. I like the X3. I think you're going to enjoy it. Some other decent things in the field here, but not worth the hassle or the additional cost. Uh, now, the second part of this is a little more complex to unpack. I don't think BMW having a factory in the US, Spartanburg, I believe, South Carolina, really helps them per se, or hurts them, excuse me. But I also think they could be, they're not immune to some of the supply chain problems by that either. I mean, let me put it this way. Uh, there's a million Ford factories in Michigan, and you still can't get like a bunch of their products. So it doesn't necessarily mean, hey, you have a factory here, you're good to go. Uh, but I also think it can help. It doesn't hurt. Let me put it that way. Mm -hmm. So that's that's kind of a roundabout way of you know approaching it. But that's my thought. Yeah, um, I think I think you're spot on. Um, it it can't hurt. You know, it, yeah. like having your supply chain um, emanating from or your factory emanating from the com uh, country that you're selling the vehicles in, you would think logistically that it would simplify processes. You know, that's not the only vehicle that's that's made in America. Um, and like you said, Greg, a lot of those made in America vehicles are still supply constrained and difficult to find and selling for over sticker and, and all of that. So, you know, there's, there might be something there to that. Um, I don't think it's because the X3 is not, is, is unpopular compared to the others. The X3 is a strong seller. Um, you know, it, it's a strong competitor in that segment. Um, definitely would be one of the vehicles that, that I would say, yeah, take, take a look at the X3. It's pretty darn good. Um, X1, not so much. X3, yeah. Um, so I think you made a good choice there. Um, I really like the color combo you went with too. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I, I don't know that I've, that I've seen one in person with the graphite and, um, that deep red interior. Um, but I like that color combo in general. Um, so you had a choice in colors and I think you chose wisely, uh, if you value my opinion. Um, do I think, do I think that this situation is going to improve? Yes, I think it is improving. I think if you would have done this experiment um, 18 months ago, it would have been even more uh, irritating and hard to find what you're looking for. Um, I think we're like a little bit on the upswing. Um, I think it's awesome that you were able to find the car that you wanted for the price that you wanted to pay um, and not have to wait forever for it. Um, the flip side of that though, is I think kind of, you know, people's, people's perception of how you buy cars is changing a little bit too. Um, the, the, you know, the, the classic American way is, Hey, I'm looking, you know, I remember, I remember when we, uh, in the mid nineties, um, we, my family bought a, a Jeep Cherokee. Um, and how did we do it? Well, we went to the biggest Jeep dealership, um, in the area um, looked at all of the Cherokees that they had on the lot and picked the one that we liked the best, um, both by color and by options. That's how Americans for years and years and years have done their car shopping. I think that's kind of changing. Um, the idea of ordering the one that you want, the idea of, you know, even putting a reservation fee down, like there's going to be more and more and more of that as time goes on. Um, there's going to be probably, you know, less of a push to have every different vehicle on, you know, on the lot, uh, to choose from, um, instant gratification is still going to be a part of it, I think. Um, but it's probably going to diminish in importance as the years go on. Yeah, no, I, I, I tend to agree with you. I think it's, it's a different buying experience as time has changed. I mean, even from when we were growing up. So, uh, well, I think we ended up 
this was a kind of an impromptu show. Um, I'll put it out there. We thought maybe we'd end up going about 45 minutes. We're at an hour and 15. So, hey, there we go. Uh, obviously, this was your reg regularly scheduled podcast. But uh, thanks to Jeremy for stepping in. Associate Editor Byron Hurd was going to be the host this week. You might remember Jeremy was on pretty recently talking about the Ineos Grenadier, uh, sort of Byron's turn, but he lost power. Um, and I think it's back on as we hear this. So that's good news. Um, Full circle. We uh, uh, back to the weather in Detroit, huh? Yeah, you got to do that. You got to do that. He lost power because of the ice storm. And uh, here I am filling in. Beautiful, beautiful here in Columbus. I know you're under the weather. Um, it's four o'clock. The Red Wings play the Rangers tonight in hockey. I'm excited about that. An original six matchup. My plan is to open up a Sam Adams cherry wheat, which I oh. think is a good spring beer. You know, it's not spring at all right now, but sure, whatever. You have any go-tos besides, I don't know, Advil and hot soup or anything <laughs> you're going to be drinking uh, this evening? So, I just got back from Scotland and uh, yeah. um, I've got a lot more scotch in my house than beer right now. Nice. Um, I do have some, I did my taxes uh, under the influence of COVID last weekend and my wife uh, uh, felt bad for me for spending my sick day doing that. So she uh, rewarded me with a Bell's um, nice. two-hearted hot pack. It was like nice. four different kinds of Bell's um, IPAs um, and uh, I've been you know, slowly working my way through some of those. I haven't tried them all yet. I haven't tasted them all. Um, the other day I had, it's the can is still sitting here. Um, big hearted IPA, which is an Imperial kind of a oh, big cool. IPA, 9.5 yeah. ABV. Um, Ooh. only that's, that's a, that's a one and done -er. Um, but, uh, yeah. it was, it was good. I enjoyed it. Sounds good. Well, Hey, um, it's not quite spring yet, although it is in Columbus for another 12 hours. Use some pretty good good beers to there you go. get you through whatever you're trying to get through. Let's put it that way. If you enjoy the podcast, please give us five stars on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get the show. Send us your spend my monies. We are starting to run down on those. That's podcast at autoblog.com. Uh, come back next week if you're listening to this for the launch of Autoblog Electric. We're going to have a page devoted to electric vehicles. Uh, stood up. There's some uh, infrastructure. There's a map charging uh, utility that I think is going to be pretty cool. So check that out. Have a great week, everybody. Be safe out there. We'll see you next time.